Today is the second week of a preaching series in this Easter season that we will follow through the end of May. And in the pivotal text in the Gospel according to Mark, Jesus asks his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And they respond that some believe that he is John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the other prophets. Jesus continues, though, pressing them directly with the question, but who do you say that I am? And it is still the question that all disciples of Jesus, that you and I, must answer for ourselves. This series of sermons seeks to answer that question by first turning it around. Before we can truly declare who we say Jesus is... I want to suggest that we need to hear Jesus tell us who he is in his own words. In the Gospel of John, seven times we find Jesus saying, I am. It's language reminiscent of God's name given to Moses, Yahweh, I am who I am. Yes, these texts give us a glimpse of who Jesus really is in his own words. And last week we heard Jesus say, I am the bread of life. So today we turn to a second saying, as we hear this word of God found in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. As he walked along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He says, I do not know. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do you remember how the entire story of Scripture begins? All the way back in the book of Genesis. Yes, in the beginning, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void. Darkness covers the face of the deep while the Spirit of God moves over the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, I certainly was not there when all this creating and calling happened. But in my mind's eye, I suspect that this light God called into being was not just the flare of a match, not just a spark, not just a candle flickering in the wind. No, this was light, overwhelming, awe-inspiring, blind your eyes, take your breath away, light. In the Gospel of John, as he recounts Jesus' life and ministry, John loves to employ the metaphor of light and its contrast with darkness. Perhaps you remember the opening chapter of this Gospel, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being with him, in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness does not overcome it. Each year I read that particular text from the first chapter of John on Christmas Eve. And so perhaps that's the mental image I get as I read those verses again. Can you picture that in your mind, Christmas Eve? The lights are dim, the Advent wreath is lit with five solitary candles. The light seems to push back the darkness, but ever so slightly. The darkness threatens. But then the light begins to be shared from one person to another, one pew, and then the next. Slowly the light spreads. The darkness retreats to the corners of the room and it's replaced by a soft glow. It's nice. It's warm. It's comforting. But what if John intended for us to think not of the nice and sweet candlelight of Christmas Eve, but instead of God calling forth the light at the beginning of creation? In the beginning, there was light. It was dramatic. It was powerful. It throws back the chaos. It banishes the darkness. It shatters the deep. Suddenly, life is possible. What if that's what John had in mind? What if what has come into being was life and the life was the light of all people? Not just a flicker. Not just a candle in the wind, but light that transforms a new creation of a new people. The darkness is not just held at bay. It is defeated and banished for the light has come. Yes, I wonder if that's what John had in mind. And if so, it changes the way in which I read our text for today as well. For this account in chapter 9 is not just a simple healing story. Now this is a revelation story. This is a glimpse at the creative power of God to make all things new. For this darkness transforming, status quo upsetting, light of the world has come and it has a name. His name is Jesus. Yes, Jesus is walking along and he encounters this man who has been blind from birth. The disciples are interested in the cause and effect. Blindness must be the result of sin, right? So who sinned, this man or his parents? But Jesus is not interested in that question. We should not, not let it sidetrack us this morning either. As biblical scholar Lamar Williamson writes, Jesus changes the man's blindness from a result to a possibility an occasion for the revelation of God's glorious work. Neither Jesus nor the evangelist is interested in speculations about where sin and darkness come from. No, the world is blind and God's work is to heal it. Yes, as Jesus tells the first disciples, we must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. For as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus first makes that claim that he's the light of the world back in chapter 8. But back there, it almost comes across as just passing and a comment about a festival in relation to some lights there. But here, what it means to be the light of the world is enacted. We get to see it as a revelation of this new creation. Once again, echoing back to those early chapters in Genesis, we find Jesus at work in the mud, crafting something new. 
Back in Genesis, God was in the mud, working in the mud, and God created Adam, a creature of earth, and breathed life into him. Here, Jesus is at work in the mud. He's creating something different. He's creating sight, new eyes, we might say, spitting in the mud, making this paste, putting it on the man's eyes, telling him to go and wash in the pool called scent. The man does. And once again, from the waters emerge a new creation. For the man went and washed and came back able to see. Yes, this darkness transforming, status quo upsetting, light of the world enables the blind to see. And those who now see are not just those who've lost their sight through some act of the will or through some accident. No, those who have never seen before get new eyes. The light brings a new creation enacted and envisioned by Jesus himself. However, not everyone finds this new creation easy to understand. Not everyone welcomes it. Most of the verses we read today, the vast majority of the rest of this entire chapter, are the man's friends and then the Pharisees and leaders trying to figure out if the man who now sees is the same man as the one who was born blind. The man repeatedly echoes the words of Jesus saying, I am he. And yet still they do not believe. They find every possible excuse not to believe. The fact that the healing happened on the Sabbath to their belief that not since the beginning of creation has someone been born blind and now healed. They refuse to see what the light of the world has revealed to them. Despite this darkness transforming, status quo upsetting, light of new creation, the people continue to love the darkness. And the darkness does not go down without a fight. In John's gospel, Jesus is moving quickly to Jerusalem and to the cross that awaits. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And Jesus is a light that doesn't just flicker, but transforms, that creates, that banishes the darkness. The darkness will threaten once again, but even on the cross, that light still shines. We had an experience like that here at Reed Memorial just over a year ago. In our Monday Thursday service, we used 120 small tea lights on a little table with a glass cover. We placed the lights on the table to create a marvelous cross. The tea lights were supposed to burn for four hours, much longer than we needed. So I decided that we would light all the candles before the service began. They would burn throughout the service and then at the conclusion as everyone departed in silence each person would come forward and extinguish a single candle. I have to tell you it was a stunning display and visual image as the service progressed. The lit candles reflected off the glass doubling the effect of this cross of light. However, as we reached communion, some of you remember, the candles had burned for about 45 minutes at this point. Something happened. It was either the Holy Spirit or the air conditioner. I can't say for sure. <laughs> but it kicked on and moving air caused those tea lights to flare up. Especially in the middle of the cross where there was a concentration of heat and buildup of wax, the candles began to overflow, joining their flames together. Suddenly we had a fire. <laughs> it wasn't what I'd call a blaze, but it was on the way. Faithful elders from the worship committee at the time, Ben Kay and Dana Cook, stepped forward and with small snuffers attempted to put out the growing flames. It appeared to be a losing battle as the heat grew hotter, the flames flickered higher. And suddenly that glass tabletop, it cracked with a loud crash. 
I was in the midst of the great prayer of thanksgiving at the communion table and that shattering glass startled me but I tell you I just kept praying <laughs> and with perseverance and a little grace those flames were gradually brought under control now I share that story with you this morning not because I intend to ever create such a cross out of tea lights again no we learned our lesson that time but I share it with you because in that unexpected and yet powerful way, it reminds us of the light that even the darkness of the cross cannot contain. For the darkness transforming, the status quo upsetting, the uncontrollable light of the world has come. And that light has a name, Jesus and in the healing of a man born blind, he reveals that the very same light and power that burst forth in the world on the very first day can touch even you and me. My friends, can you see him? Who do you say that Jesus is? Can you claim that he is the light of the world? Not just a spark, not a candle in the wind, but the power and the presence of a new creation that might heal even our blindness. Do you believe this? Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Light of the world, you stepped down into the darkness of this world and banished it. In our own lives, we see the darkness continue to threaten and we need to see you more clearly, O oh Lord. Bring your light, bring your power, your new creation to our eyes so that we might see that we might find our lives and this world transformed by your very presence. For you are the light of the world. And it is in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Our friends, in response to hearing